Um, we have uh, uh, about them uh, a little later on, but right now I'm just going to ask our president, uh, Mr. Jermaine Eslop, the president of the association, uh, the alumni is in Jamaica and, and the world, uh, all six chapters at this point, uh, just to say a few words of, uh, uh, to us. Uh, Jeremy, is he here? Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to another Arden Alumni webinar. Okay, we're looking forward to a wonderful evening. Um, the last <laughs> webinar that we have, it was quite successful, and I'm looking forward to another one. So welcome to everyone who is a member of the Arden Alumni Association. So far, I am seeing 22 persons um, sure. participating and I expect it to grow. I'm sure that we have representation from the Arden Alumni Association in various jurisdictions. So welcome to the membership and the executive team from Jamaica, from Florida, from Atlanta, and Toronto, and New York. And if there's anyone who is not affiliated with Arden High School, and you want to consider yourself a guest, then I'm giving you special welcome. And I hope that you will find this um, evening's webinar very informative and just please feel free to participate whenever you are asked to do so. Welcome again everyone. Thank you Jermaine. Um, before we go into the meat of the whole discussion this evening, I just want to properly introduce our, uh, you know, the, our three panelists who will will be helping us this evening to get through this. Um, first of all, let me let me go the lady the lady first, Maxine White Levy. Uh, she's a, a retired attorney at law. Um, you know, over thirty years experience in financial service industry. Um, throughout her career, she served on boards of nonprofit organizations and uh, some independent bodies. She currently volunteers and mentoring young entrepreneurs in Fayette County in Georgia. Um, so um, welcome, uh, Maxine. Um, Anthony A. Williams is a lawyer, 29 years at the, at the job and a justice of the peace in Jamaica, married with three kids. And he, um, his profession takes him across, across several disciplines of law, uh, civil, criminal litigation, criminal litigation, commercial law, corporate law, insurance, and a number of others. Um, uh, his other achievements include uh, being on several boards, um, including our alma mater, Arden High School. Uh, on the lighter side, he likes to read volleyball and table tennis. And the last bit, uh, the last bit, uh, I must say, he's one of the coaches of the recently uh, conquered of this, the, the school challenge quiz. So um, big up, my friend, uh, Anthony, you've done a good job. And finally, Paul Barnett um, has uh, over 30 years hands-on experience gained in, um, from experience in management cons consulting, business and business development. Um, the part that I like most is that Paul has, has been in, um, uh, in Toronto, uh, actively working for the Toronto chapter for over 40 years. Um, you know, this is just not only, I guess, not only Toronto, but uh, in the, the entire Arden Alumni Association. So hats off to you as well, Paul, and thank you so much for your service. All three of you, thank you so much, and we're, we're looking to you to, to actually enlighten our, 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 our visitors, all of us, as to what this subject means. Um, our moderator for this evening is Mr. Mark Thomas. And he will be navigating, he'll be addressing and kind of moving the parts for this evening's presentation. Now, throughout the 
the presentation, there is, you have the ability or you have the access to re uh, request or put your questions in, but we prefer, if you can, put them in caps so at least we know um, what they are. We don't want to wait until the end and we have this big gap at the end waiting for questions. So as you have it in your mind, if you hear something of interest, um, put your question in and it will be collected for us later on when that time comes. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the rest of the, uh, the evening's uh, activity over to Mark Thomas to navigate. Mark? Okay, thank you, Denzel. And welcome, everyone. It's good to see everybody on the line. I know others are going to be joining us. And a very special welcome to the Arden family all across the North American diaspora. I don't know if we have anybody beyond North America, maybe in the Caribbean or in Europe. Welcome, everyone. I also want to welcome uh, the few persons who are joining us who never had the very great privilege of going to Aden High School, but they are, they have been affiliated in some way or the other with an Aden person. So we're very happy that uh, we have guests and friends of Aden who are joining us also online. And so we want to have a conversation this evening about estate planning. Now, this is a very interesting and necessary topic for all of us. If we live on the planet, if we have families or don't have families, if we own anything, we need to consider this matter of estate planning, no matter what the size, um, we have to consider estate planning. Now, our three panelists um, have shared much information. They have try to uh, distill the information in, in, a, in a short presentation uh, this evening, and they're going to be presenting to us. So I would love to go to the slide at this point. So if you guys can allow me, give me host privileges. I will um, bring on the presentation that has been put together uh, for the panelists. And so today we're talking about planning for life and afterlife, estate planning basics in uncertain times. And we certainly do know that we're living in uncertain times. COVID-19 has been the great leveler across all countries and all societies in the world. And we're certainly learning a lot about humanity, a lot about community, a lot about property, a lot about family. Um, and so certainly in, in, in uncertain times, persons tend to consider issues of family, um, issues of estate and property. So as we consider our topic this evening on estate planning, a quick disclaimer that uh, by law I have to read. So I want to read this disclaimer. The information presented in this forum is intended to provide a general overview on a topic of interest to many of us. It is not intended to provide legal, financial, or tax advice in any jurisdiction of focus or any specific situation. Estate planning is subject to the laws of the country and the jurisdiction in which individuals reside uh, and where they are located. You should contact a legal, financial, and tax professional in your jurisdiction for specific advice. So that's our disclaimer, and we'll be reminding you as we move along. So there are certain assumptions this evening. Uh, we assume that you have joined this webinar because maybe the COVID-19 pandemic has prompted you to become a bit more reflective on your life, your family, your loved ones, uh, your estate. We assume that your assets do not exceed US $3 million. Uh, but if you are a heavy roller in the, in the group this evening, no problem. Please stay for the presentation. Uh, and that you have assets that you want to protect. Uh, you own things and you hope to own more things in your life. And you have friends, relatives, loved ones, who you want to protect 
after you die. And you know maybe one person who has died recently, uh, or maybe you know of some case where somebody has died, uh, didn't leave a will, and there's just a lot of confusion and conflict over the estate of that person. So we want to delve into all of these issues as best as we can. We want to keep this session to about one hour and 15 minutes. We want to reserve most of the time for conversation and to get your feedback. So we don't have much time for reticence this evening after the pre presentation. Please jump in with your questions, uh, jump in with, with your comments, and let us have a lively conversation. So our three panelists, erudite people, have been uh, introduced to you by Denzel, Maxine White-Levy, in the United States and has practiced in the New York area, uh, now lives in Atlanta. Anthony Atticus Williams, who I had the pleasure of going to school with and participating on Schools Challenge Quiz with, and he continues that wonderful tradition. Again, congratulations on coaching, on being one of the coaches, Anthony, for the, the, the winning Arden team this year. I think that's a, an amazing uh, feat this year in the midst of COVID-19. And of course, Paul Barnett, I call him the mayor of Toronto, the governor of all the provinces of Canada. If you ever want to live or plan to live in Canada, You've got to call Paul. Paul has done so much work over many years to settle particularly Jamaicans in Canada and to help them through the ropes. And he's our financial specialist on the panel this evening. So we have two lawyers, very accomplished lawyers in their own rights. And we also have Paul Barnett uh, from Canada who's joining us. So let's lead off this evening with our first panelist, Maxine. I'm going to hand over to Maxine now as she presents, uh, starting off with setting your house in order for life. So over to you, Maxine. Thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you, Denzel, for that um, lovely introduction. Um, when you look at the first slide, it talks about setting your house in order for life. And the the overall focus of this um, this evening's discussion is planning for life as well as afterlife and as a practical matter once your eyes are closed there's not much you can do so you have to set the wheels in motion once you're alive so that things are set for your afterlife so we're talking about estate planning and I'm sure you're all wondering what is estate planning. I like to think of it as a process, not a single step. And it's a process during your lifetime where you acquire and manage your assets and also arrange for the distribution of those assets once you're gone. Um, in its simplest form, it's really a documented roadmap. And I focus on documented because if it's not in writing, it never happened. Um, so it's a documented roadmap on how you increase and protect your assets. And the best way to distribute those assets to your heirs, your friends, places and institutions in society that you care about and minimizing the taxes you pay whilst acquiring and managing those assets. Now, it's a process. It's not a one step done and done. So your estate plan will require a periodic review of what you, what you have set up. And periodic review is necessary because your circumstances change. If you are in your, well, most folks in their 20s don't start thinking about estate planning, but let's say you, you're one of the um, really forward thinking ones and um, you start planning in your 20s and 30s. As your situation change, 
you may want to, you should take a look at your plan. You get married, you, you buy a house, you, you, you plan to take care of your parents, but a parent dies. You have children, a child dies. Those are all life events where you should be looking at your estate plan and make a conscious decision, do I need to make changes in my plan? Uh, next slide. So a good plan requires several steps and, and, and several um, things to be put in place. And if you plan carefully and with the help of the right professionals, meaning lawyers, accountants, um, tax advisors, just the way you set things up is an unconscious part of your plan. And by that I mean you acquire property, you make a conscious decision, do I want to acquire this property in my name alone? or do I want to acquire it jointly? That's typical if you have a spouse. So do I acquire pro property jointly with my spouse with right of survivorship? As you acquire things like uh, insurance policies, those are instruments where you are usually able to designate a beneficiary. So assets like insurance policies, IRAs, pension plans, annuities, you generally have the opportunity to indicate whom you want to have access to that asset, that property, after you're gone. Now, at the outset, we talked about uh, one of the assumptions we made that was that um, anybody on this call probably is worth less than $3 million. And I say that because once you reach that level of, of ownership of assets, um, you should be looking at other things, like putting assets in trust. There are different types of trusts. Um, you have living trusts, you have secret trusts, you have testamentary trusts. Um, I'm not going into all the details of these um, instruments right now, but just to give you a high level exposure to options you have for how you own your assets. And then probably the one that you hear the most about is the will, your last will and testament. What you need to have as part of your estate plan. Um, you also should consider putting in place a power of attorney. You might not die, but you might get very sick when you, and you can't manage your own affairs. No matter how much you try to convince, well, not you, your, 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 your representatives, no matter how much they might try to convince a bank, an insurance company, your creditor, that, you, that they are authorized to speak on your behalf, unless you have a power of attorney in place, listing that person as your agent, there is not much they can do for you if you are disabled. So a power of attorney is a good thing to have in place. The power of attorney basically helps to take care of your financial decision. Another thing, that you should consider is a healthcare proxy or a living will. That helps in taking care of your health decisions. Having gone through this list, you should know that the type of plan you create will depend on the value of your assets, all the things you own, your personal and family situation, Obviously, if you are a single individual with no children, never been married, with very few assets, your plan might be significantly different from somebody who has, you know, seven children, been married three times, ex-spouses to come into the picture, um, aging parents that they want to take care of. So your personal situation will dictate the kind of plan you put in place. 
So you're probably thinking, where do I begin? What are, my, what are the steps in creating an estate plan? I like to look at this as identifying what you own and who you owe. So this is where you identify your assets and your liabilities, what you own and who you owe. And it all, it's always helpful to sort of keep a, even if it's not a formal list, but a list of things that you have. Um, cash, cash equivalent. Um, by cash, I mean actual cash, as well as money in the bank, whether it's a savings, savings account, checking account, a CD. Um, oh, I see I have that separately as bank accounts, okay. Then you, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, real estate, whether it's the residence you live in, it's land you own, wherever you own that land, investment property, rental property, um, business property, vacation property. Um, if you have business interests, do you, are you a partner in a business with, with somebody? Um, Retirement benefits, do you have those benefits on your job? Um, you have a pension plan, you have a 401k, you're self-employed or retired and you have an IRA. Uh, do you have insurance policies, um, whether on the job, your own life insurance, disability insurance, health insurance? And also your personal property, your car, your truck, your RV, your boat your artwork, your jewelry, your furniture, those are the assets that you need to take into account. And then you also need to make a list and be cognizant of your liabilities. Mortgages on properties you own, personal loans, and your personal loans would include um, your car loan, if you have student loans, things of that nature business loans, if you have business interests, credit card debt, um, if you have taken out loans on your insurance policies, do you have medical bills? And the one that you should never forget is do you owe taxes? So as you attempt to put together your plan, these are the things you need to have top of mind. What are your assets? What are your liabilities? What do, you, what do I have and who do I owe? Then the next step should be identifying your heirs and your intended beneficiaries. Heirs are generally people related to you by blood or marriage. Um, the, the fancy term for your heirs are uh, consanguinity, related by blood. And that, typically includes your spouse, your children, um, including adopted children, your grandchildren, your parents, your siblings, aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, and cousins. The, the list of heirs tend to be the ones who are in line to inherit from you if you don't have a will. On the other hand, your beneficiaries, those are your choice. Those are the people that you, if you choose to take care of them during, during your life and after, it's your choice. They, 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 the law isn't gonna step in to say you have to take care of these people. However, if you don't have a will and you wanted to take care of these people, chances are, they will not benefit from your estate. So in that list, I include like your godchildren, um, caregiver. We, in, my, in my practice, I, I would see a lot of times, especially elderly clients who either have never been married, have no children, but have a long time caregiver. They wanna take care of that person. A best friend, um, your church your favorite charity, which might be Arden, 
you know, or whatever alma mater you have, your, you know, your college, um, your side chick, former spouse, your pet. Now, do not laugh at the side chick. Every person, entity I have put on this list, I have seen it. I have seen them named in wills. It happens, and if you choose to do it, it's your choice. So early on, I said you, you really need to document things because good intentions are really not enough. If it's not in writing, it didn't happen. You might have intended to give that Bentley to your girlfriend's son, but you didn't put it in writing. Once you are gone, your words, your promises have no effect. They must be documented. So in, in, in documenting, the things you would take into account is, did I purchase that property as a joint tenant? So the title to the property would reflect that it's joint ownership and the other party has a right to own that property after I'm gone. So that's what it means by joint ownership with right of survivorship. Have you designated a beneficiary or beneficiaries on things like your insurance policies, your pension plan, your IRA? As I said earlier, there are certain kinds of assets that lend themselves to having you designate a beneficiary. You, your, your estate is large enough that it might be beneficial to have a trust. So have you considered creating a trust? Whether it's a living trust, and a living trust is effective during your lifetime and after. A testamentary trust is only effective after you're gone. And I throw in special needs trust because there are situations where if you have like a disabled child, and you want to be sure that that child is taken care of, you can create a special needs trust to ensure that after you're gone, that child will still be taken care of. You created a will. Very important thing to have. And um, as we go on later in the presentation, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the um, importance of that. So on this slide, it's just amplification of what, uh, of the benefits of the, the various kinds of documentation. So things like um, an insurance policy where you designate your beneficiary, uh, an account or real estate that's held in joint names, those assets do not need to go through probate or administration in order to be transferred to the beneficiary. So that's what I mean when I say direct transfer. Upon your passing, if you had a joint account, the, 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 the bank will automatically pay the balance in the account to the joint party. If you own real estate, in, in a joint tenancy with right of survivorship, the property will pass automatically to the other named person on the title. And there's another, I'm not sure if this is true in, in every country, but it's certainly very common in the US, uh, something that's called a payable on death account or an in trust for account. We, we refer to it in the business as, as a poor man's trust. And basically, it's an account where the title says, John Brown, payable on death to Mary Smith. An account titled like that does not have to go through probate. That is an account that will pass by direct transfer. The next and probably uh, more familiar instrument is your will. 
and your will documents that, that the transfer of property at your death to designated persons or entities. You don't have to leave your assets to an individual. You can leave it all to your church or to your school or to your pet, um, but you, you have to put that in writing. So a will is only effective upon your death. And the, the maker can pretty much change his or her mind up until the day he passes, as long as he's competent. And I put that in there because whenever a will is created, is executed in close proximity to the date of death, invariably somebody who did not get what he thought he or she thought he should get is going to try to contest it. So, and they usually raise the argument that the, the deceased person, that you weren't competent to make a will. So, um, I, I want to point out that the, the maker of the will, the testator, can change his or her mind at any time, disinherit anybody, as long as he's competent, until just prior to death. And then the other less familiar, but sort of gaining more traction among um, the people that I see is the, the putting off your assets in a trust. A trust is basically a contract where the, the, the trustor, the person who owns the assets, creates a contract, put in all those assets in a trust to be managed by a trustee for his benefit, for, for, the, for the trustor's benefit. And it can be for the trustor's benefit, the, the, the creator's wife's benefit, the children's benefit. But it's, there, there are three parties usually in a trust, the creator, trustor, the trustee, and the beneficiary. You can actually be all three of these, and it's still a valid trust. However, on your death, someone else has to benefit from the trust. So you're not necessarily giving away control of your property by creating a trust. The, the, the beauty, the sort of benefit of, of having a trust which goes um, beyond your life is that it doesn't require going through probate. So those are ways you can document your intentions for your assets during your life and after you pass. Now, we all know that tomorrow is not promised. So that's the reason why this, this, this seminar is, is to encourage you to sort of set your house in order for your afterlife. And how do you do that? As I said at the outset, um, the, the will is probably the, the document that most people are familiar with. And, um, you know, it, it, it works. It, it definitely works. And if you are wondering, should I have one or should I not have one? What I've found in my years of practice is, um, I don't know if it's a cultural thing, if it's a generational thing, but for some reason, Caribbean people are very resistant to creating a will. They think that they create a will, you know, they're, they're counting the days to their death. That is just so not true. And if nothing else, you're saving your loved ones the, just the stress of figuring out what to do with your assets. So, I'm a strong proponent of having a will. And if you're trying to make a decision as to do I really need one, I think when I go through this information, um, hopefully it will help to convince you that you probably need one. So if you pass and you have a will, um, your estate is considered testate, it means you died with a will. 
if you have a will, you control and direct who inherits your asset. I mean, that's, that should be um, enough, an, enough of an argument to convince you that you, a, a will is the, is the way to go. You also direct who administers the distribution of your estate. Um, you get to name an executor and, um, and an alternate, just in case the one you name is unwilling or unable to serve. You also avoid the cost of surety bonds. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit because if you don't have a will and um, your next of kin, whether it's spouse, child, parent, um, goes to the court to be appointed administrator of your estate, one of the first things that they will require to do is sort of put a dollar value on the asset and you have to, well, they, the administrator has to secure a bond for the value of the estate to make sure that the administrator performs and the assets are protected. So if you draft a will, you can say that you don't want your executor or any of your fiduciaries to have to receive, a, to have to obtain a bond. So that's a big benefit there. Um, bonds are not cheap. And it also enables the ordinary settlement of your estate and it spares your heirs and your loved ones the unnecessary expenses and the confusion and grief of trying to figure out what to do with your asset. Now, if you don't have a will, you have passed in test. And the laws of the jurisdiction where you reside will determine who inherits your asset. Now, this varies by country. It varies in the US, it varies by state. Um, and I'm sure you, you're probably better off not having a court dictate how your assets get distributed. Court will also determine who administers the settlement of your estate and appoint an administrator. Most statutes give uh, an order of preference as to who can qualify to be our administrator. And the, 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 the order goes spouse first, adult child, um, parent in that order. And as I mentioned earlier, no, no, no will, you will be required to obtain a, a surety bond. Um, I'm told that in Jamaica, the Administrator General will intervene, particularly to protect um, minors. And it's generally just more costly to administer your estate if there is no will. Next slide, Mark. Okay, so there are some basic elements that your will should have, must have. It must be in writing. Most states in the US require it to be typed. There are some exemptions where a handwritten will will be accepted. And I know in New York, it's um, deployed servicemen are they will accept a will for probate if it's handwritten but the formalities of executing the will still has to be the formalities still have to be followed um you must you must name the test stage so if mark is preparing a will his name must be in there we must know that it's mark's will it must name an executor and executrix so um, must name somebody who will administer the estate. It must be signed by the testator. It must be dated by the testator. And the dating is important because you never know when you're gonna pass. And there are people who throughout their lifetime, they have created three, four wills whenever somebody in their family ticks them off and they wanna disinherit, disinherit them. They say, oh, I need a new will. 
you cast and they're going through your papers and they find six cop, six wills. The latest date will control. So it is important that not only you sign it as, your, as a testator, but it must be dated. It must be witnessed by at least two witnesses and you must name beneficiary. Um, it can be everything I own goes to my estate. That's not the best way to do it because you, we still have to figure out who makes up your estate. Now, so that's the basics of a will. But a properly drafted will should have a few other things. It should direct your executives to pay your debts, your taxes, and your funeral expenses. We know they have to do it, um, but in order to dot your I's and cross your T's, I recommend that um, whoever prepares your will put in a clause that directs the executive to pay, executive to pay debts, taxes, and funeral expenses. Now this one, this one gets a lot of attention. It must provide an appropriate share for your spouse. And I tell this to my clients, if you are still married, even if you're not getting along, make sure you give your spouse what the statutes of your state says she must get, he or she must get. Generally, if you don't have children, your spouse gets 50%. If you have children, your spouse gets a third. So don't just think you can leave the kettle, the potted plant to your spouse and she'll be happy. You're asking for a will contest if you don't leave an appropriate chair to your spouse. You should also name a contingent executor or executrix. And I say that because you draft your will today, you don't know when you're gonna pass. I had a situation recently where um, a friend of mine whose will I had done a few years ago passed and she had named her brother as her executor. Did not know that her brother would have Alzheimer's. So, He's unable to serve, but luckily this was a properly drafted will and we had an, 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 an alternate. So this is important. There should be a contingent executor or executrix because you don't know that the person you are naming will be around, will be able, will be willing, and it just cuts down on the headache of having the courts trying to figure out who is the next best person to serve. You would have already put that in your will. You should also consider a trustee guardian for minors or disabled children if you have those. Um, generally, children under 18 cannot um, collect the assets outright, so it would have to be distributed to uh, a guardian for their benefit. And you know, if, if you're drafting your will and you have a three-year-old and you are terminally ill, you, you should think about, um, my, my child probably will not be over the age of 18 by the time I pass, so I should name a guardian. Should also have a residuary clause. And the residuary clause should not be like an afterthought. The residuary clause says all the rest remainder of my estate I give to X, Y, you know, X or Y. And the reason I say it shouldn't be as an afterthought, you might not believe this, people have won the lottery and did not think of it when they draft their will. And that lottery winnings now falls into the residuary. So you want to give careful thought to who 
should benefit from that luxury that you did not contemplate when you drafted your will. I mean, ideally, once you win the lottery, you should be um, drafting a new will. But there have been cases where folks have just forgotten and the residuary clause was an afterthought and the person who was named to receive the residuary got a huge windfall. It should also waive the requirement of bonds for all fiduciaries. So there should be language to the effect that I direct that my executor, guardian, trustee should serve without bond. So those are the basic elements and basic elements of a will and what a properly drafted will should contain. In the US, um, almost every state has a small estate statute. So if you didn't have a will and you have very few assets, there is the opportunity to settle your estate without having to go through the process of probate or administration. The types and the value of the assets can be claimed that can be claimed and distributed under the small estate statutes. They vary from state to state and they vary in amounts. Um, I think in New York, you can claim up to 30,000 as a small estate. Assets can be claimed by your next of kin, by your creditors, by the funeral home. That's under the small estate statute. Generally, you would be required, well, they, the person claiming would be required to complete an affidavit to the holder of the asset. So if it's a bank account for, you know, $300, most banks even have those um, forms that you can fill out claiming who you are in relation to the, the, the deceased person, um, what is the basis for your claim, um, if, for instance, you pay the funeral expenses, you can claim that. And there are certain time periods um, within which you can make that claim. As an example, in New York, a spouse can claim it almost immediately, a child can claim it after 30 days, and I think a funeral home can claim it after six months. So there is an opportunity for people who didn't have a whole lot, didn't have a will, doesn't want to go through the process of administration, there is an opportunity if the assets are small enough, they can be claimed without going through the process of um, probate or administration. And that's in the US. It's my understanding that there may not be similar statutes in, in, in uh, Canada or Jamaica, but uh, either Paul or Anthony can correct, correct me. Okay, Maxine. Uh, we wanted to move into the other section where we talk about navigating sudden death occurrences. Uh, Maxine, I just thought that was just such an incredible wealth of information. Um, I can tell by the many persons who have joined that um, the information, they've been in rapt attention listening to the information. Um, we want to talk a little bit about navigating sudden death occurrences. And, and we want to look at the whole matter of death and taxes. I know Anthony, I want to hand over to Anthony now, has many experiences dealing uh, with, with persons in, in Jamaica, um, dealing with the whole matter of death and taxes. So you want to jump in here now, Anthony? Yes, thank you very much, Mark, and a very excellent presentation by Maxine. And uh, good afternoon to each and everyone. 
Uh, in relation to the sudden death experiences, just before I deal with the death and taxes in Jamaica, there is a, a very famous individual, uh, a gentleman in Jamaica by the alias Rampus. Mm -hmm. And Rampus is the official bingo caller for uh, a significant number of major bingo events held across the, the length and breadth of Jamaica. A very outstanding bingo man. And he is my client. And he came to my office on Monday, on a Monday in particular, to do a transaction for a big contract. That contract was going to land him millions. I drafted the contract. He was supposed to come on Thursday. He did come on Thursday, but wanted some amendments to the contract. And he was scheduled to return Friday morning. Well, I got a call early Friday morning, and that was 3 o'clock. And Rampus, the outstanding bingo caller, was dead. He was D-E-D, -E -D, dead. Then there is Mr. Ian Boyne, outstanding media icon. No one thought would have left this earth. But in a matter of hours, he was admitted to the University Hospital of the West Indies in the intensive care unit, and there he was, uh, a dead man. And finally, we had Mr. Martin Henry, another media icon. He was on live television in Jamaica, paying tribute to the most honorable former Prime Minister of Jamaica, Mr. Edward Siaga. And within five minutes after he left the studios of TDJ, he collapsed in the studio. He did not leave that studio and he was a dead man. And the point I'm trying to raise is that the hour, we do not know the hour. We do not know when it is coming. And so estate planning is so important. And these are some sudden occurrences. Now, would you like me to go into the other aspect, uh, Ma, for the death and taxes in Jamaica at this time? Okay. Now, once estate comes into the picture, there are several taxes that are payable. Now, in order to understand these taxes, we're going to deal with the matrimonial home. And the matrimonial home is exempted from tax. So once someone is married, Upon death, there are no taxes payable on the estate. So whether the estate, whether the property values 2 million, 1 million, 10 million, 50 million, 100 million, no taxes are payable. Now, once you have property and the property values $10 million or less, then zero taxes will be payable. Zero taxes. But once it goes over $10 million, then the taxes will be assessed at 1.5% on each additional $1 million. Now, there are some other fees that are liable to be paid. And this is what we call the registration fees to register the executor's name or the administra administrator's name on the title. Now, what this means is that upon the death of an individual, they need someone to take over their estate. And the person who will take over their estate is called the executor, if there's a will, or the administrator, if there's no will. And that person's name uh, would have to be registered on the title. Because if the name is not registered on the title, then there will be challenges in passing the, the asset, either to the loved ones, the beneficiaries, or to sell that property to a third party. And there's a $5,000 fee. Now, there is... Uh, an application on transmission, again, another 5,000 fee. And in order to stamp the documents in the court office, there's a $5,000 fee again. And that is what we call a stamp duty on the grant. So in order for the lawyer to have the documents officially presented to the court, the government would have to be paid $5,000. Another fee that is involved is the, the lawyer's fee, and that is calculated at 5% to 7% of the gross value of the estate. In simple language, 
what we're saying is that once the, the executor or the administrator comes to the attorney, the attorney will tell them the fee. And so the fees, based on industry standards, are normally 5% to 7% of the gross value of the estate. So therefore, if the person who died had a home, and that home, say, valued $10 million, then 5% if the attorney charges five or the 500,000, 5%. And, and 7%, right? Now, the executor would normally charge a commission. They don't have to, but invariably, they are legally entitled to charge a commission. And then there is also the funeral expenses. Now, we have put the funeral expenses as low as $500,000. And these are some of the expenses that are involved. Now, there are two other items that are not on the slide. And uh, this includes um, a notice in the Gleaner. Once the estate is administered and before the creditors are paid and before the beneficiaries receive their entitlements, there's a special notice that has to go in the Gleaner to inform the world at large that the estate of John Brown is going to be, has been administered and it is going to be distributed. So the cost payable to the Gleaner company or any advertising um, companies is on an average about $10,000. Now, if I should sum it up, the lawyer's fees along with the government's fees, we're looking at about $1.5 million. The executor's fee is 7%, so we're looking at about, um, about $700,000. The funeral expenses, we put a, a minimum of 500000 but in, 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 in the past, we have seen where funeral expenses are in excess of a million dollars. In fact, when I went to the funeral home for the first time to bury my dad, it was the first time entering a funeral home. You know, Mark, I asked the funeral director, what is the cost for this casket? And he said to me, uh, this one was X dollars. And then I moved along and I said, what is the cost of this one? And he said, X plus Y dollars. Now, the, the further I moved along, the prices went up. And then he said to me, well, why not go upstairs? I said, no, let us stay downstairs. <laughs> but I decided to go upstairs. And when I went upstairs, I was shocked. The prices were even higher. And I said, why do you charge these higher fees? He says, well, you know, in the industry, there are those who like the bashment. And so there are funeral um, home caskets that ranges from $1 million to 1.5 and over. And I'm talking about only the caskets. Only the caskets. So in short, a funeral expense can run us roughly $3 million to include the repass. And therefore, one of the ways of taking care of these expenses, we would encourage our, our, um, our listeners to ensure that they have um, an insurance policy to take care of these expenses because upon death, there, are, there may be challenges and if the, 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 um, the insurance can take care of some of these expenses. Now, in wrapping up this segment, uh, Maxine did mention about the importance of taking care of the spouse absolutely important because I find in the practice and Jamaica is no exception, the United States, Canada, almost every jurisdiction, you find that there are contests to the will. So we have an act in Jamaica called the Inheritance Act. I'll repeat it. It is called the Inheritance Act. And that act basically says that if you fail or you refuse or you neglect to make reasonable or proper provisions, financial provisions for your loved one, if you fail to do that. So as Maxine said, you give her the kettle, you give her the pot, you leave $100, and the side chick, the sweetheart, uh, gets um, the, the, the lovely apartment. And there have been cases where the side chick gets the apartment. And I'm talking about real cases. And there have been cases where the court has stepped in and set aside the distribution of that apartment to the side chick or the sweetheart. So um, it is also applicable to the ladies to take care of your gentlemen. 
but more so the gentleman to take care of the lady. And then we have the Interstate Estate Property Charges Act. And that act basically says that if you fail to plan, if you don't want to plan, no problem. The government of Jamaica will surely plan for you. And then we have also the um, a, a common law principle called the constructive trust. Now, what we find is that there are several persons. They are great lovers and they become blind during the love process. And so monies are passed and properties are purchased and it is only purchased in the name of one party. We're asking persons, please, to avoid any doubts, to avoid any confusion, to avoid any animosities and to avoid any confusion. It is always best that when you're purchasing property, make sure your name is on that title. Once the name is on the title, it is a smooth flow and the issues are easily resolved. So these are some of the taxes that are applicable in Jamaica and the expenses. All right, thank you very much, Anthony. Um, lots to think about. And you know, the, these funeral costs, I know COVID-19 has leveled a lot of that. Um, people don't have the big repasts anymore. Let's talk about death and taxes in Canada. Let me bring on Paul now to talk about planning your estate, especially if you live in one of the provinces in Canada. Over to you, Paul. Uh, Paul might is not mute, is, is still muted. Okay, Paul, unmute your mic. Let us hear from you about death and taxes in Canada. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Thanks, um, Mark, and thanks, Maxine and Atticus. Thank you very much for your your presentation. A lot of it overlaps in, in Canada, but... Um, there are a few things that are a little different because of we have got the federal government and we get the provincial government and everybody wants to cut out of the death as well. Uh, the first thing I want to look at is the, the, the funeral costs. They are not all created equal. That is, choose your funeral home carefully because I've been involved now in the last three or four years with four different estates, including the estate of my wife. And it's been four different scenarios. Um, what the funeral before, my aunt, the, the, the funeral home says, we want all the money up front before we even take the body. The cemetery says, we want all the money before you put it in the ground. But I can go to another funeral home and they say, give me a 10% deposit on here's what it's going to cost. So when you're doing your estate planning, part of it is checking around on um, funeral homes and what they're, uh, what they're offering and what they're not offering. And be careful for what, what they're padded with and what they, they recommend it. The next one is probate fees. Probate fees, as um, Maxine has covered, is um, when you really don't have a will and it has to go to the, the, through the courts and, and then there's no sort of beneficiaries on, on, on some of the assets. And the, the pro, if, you, if you do your will properly, you can bypass going to probate, passing taxes, and then I've gone through all those scenarios. Where one will, you pay so much taxes, and the other will, pay very, no, no taxes or very little taxes. And it all depends on how the will is written um, and, 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 and how your distribution is set up. Um, that is, the, and, and the, the, the probate, there, there's, a, there's a small executor and there is a large executor. Anything over $50,000 in Canada is considered, anything under 50,000 is a small, estate. Anything over 50000 the large estate, and the probate fees are um, different between the small and the large. Probate fees are about, what, 5% or they're about, or there's a, there's a formula which the government worked on with the, with the probate fees. The executors, and I usually say to people when they're taking on the job of executors, 
if they, if they ask you to be an executor, just say right up front, uh, I need to know just about everything before I take that on, including the executor's fee. Because the executor's fee can run from 3% to 6%. And it can be quite a bit of work if the, you know, no beneficiaries, um, taxation, you got to run around and collect information. Lawyers, you got to be running between lawyers to get things resolved. So you want to, um, you know, look at look at the the, the 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 position of taking on an executive fee. Um, I got <laughs> taxes, personal income tax. That must be filed. That must be filed um, right after the individual. But it's one of the first things that the, the, the lawyer is going to ask you is there when was the last filing done? Then you have to find a, a, a estate uh, accountant and have that taxes done first of all, because if anything is owing, that is the first set of money that comes out of the estate. And money keeps on coming out to the government, depending on how the estate is set up. So that is another part which you have to look at. How do you shield some of these, your assets, from the government so they don't keep on dipping into it until the final taxation filing is done? I'm on one now, it's three years later. And before I can distribute the final set of, of, to the beneficiaries, I have to find a final filing with the, with the Revenue Canada to say, yes, all that was required has been paid. Yes, the first set of my funds have been paid out to the beneficiary. And as an executor, I'm holding back 10% of that just in case the government come back and say, no, you got to pay some more. So as one of the executives, which I'm, I am right now, I'm holding 10% back. Because if I don't have that and they come back and say, Oh, you owe you know another twenty thousand dollars. That twenty thousand dollars coming out of my pocket. So, as an executor, um, depending on the size of the estate, you so usually hold back about ten percent of of the um, of the total es um, estate. There are just different ways, and the government comes up with different ways of of um, distributing your assets. Maxine talked about a trust account. Very important. Very good. And it's not difficult to do and set up. And, and you know, I've gone through some of the, that process. But it is, you know, there are just little nuances in the Canadian laws. And every January or July, there are twists to estate and estate planning and taxation. And somehow, especially our West Indian folks, don't pay attention to that until the date comes up on them. Something happens, the, the sudden death takes place, and they're running all over the place because they didn't know things have changed or they didn't change their will to match the new laws of the land. So just a quick synopsis of, of uh, what's happening here in Canada. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, excellent. I'm going to bring back uh, Maxine now to talk to us about death and taxes in Canada and to wrap up this presentation pretty quickly so that we can get into the conversation. So Maxine, welcome back. Talk to us about death and taxes in the US of A. Okay, um, I'll, I'll try to run through this pretty quickly. And you know, the US has 50 states. So this is very high level. I, I'll focus more on the, um, the, 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 the taxes at the federal level. So all estates are subject to fe federal estate taxes. However, there are some exemptions and estates with below a certain threshold will not have to pay taxes. Up until the, um, the Trump administration came in, the federal estate taxes, I think was, it, 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 it exempted estates below 3 million. Then it went to 5 million. Um, under the Trump administration, that was raised to 11.58 million. So I don't think anybody on this call will have to worry about paying federal estate taxes because I suspect nobody on this call 
has an estate of over 11 million. Um, there's a strong suspicion that at the end of 2020, the exemption will go back down to somewhere around 7 million. There's also an unlimited marital deduction that allows you to pass all your assets to your spouse tax free, federal tax free. You know, the state may want taxes, but um, at the federal level, no taxes. Um, most states have no estate tax. And I want to differentiate between the estate tax, which is paid by the estate, or the inheritance tax, which is paid by the person who receives the, the, the bequest. So most states have no estate tax or inheritance tax to be paid by the beneficiary. There are a few states that have both the estate and the inheritance tax. Um, those states include, I know New York has both and New Jersey has both. Some states have the estate tax to be paid by the estate, but no inherent, inheritance tax to be paid by the beneficiary. Uh, an example of that is Connecticut. Connecticut does have an estate tax, but not an inheritance tax. Um, because there's so, there, there so many variations by state, I didn't want to get into um, the costs of probate and administration. But you can be looking at filing basic filing fees just to file the will to get an executor appointed or to file to get an administrator named. You can be looking at a fee as low as $200. But that goes up kind of exponentially as the value of the of this estate increases. Um, I very often get the question, um, can't I just go online and get a form and create my own will? And my response to that is, you know, you can defend yourself for murder. But if you want things done, in a way that's least painful to you or your estate, you're better off consulting professionals. Taxes like death are inevitable. So uh, 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 an attorney, a tax professional, an accountant can help you navigate how best to structure your affairs to minimize the amount of taxes you have to pay. Um, in order that we have enough time for questions, I'm just going to end there. But I, I want to kind of wrap it up uh, so that you focus on some important takeaways from, from today's presentation. Estate planning is not just for the wealthy. Just as you make plans for your life, you really should make plans for your afterlife, your death. A proper estate plan can minimize the amount your estate will pay in taxes, in administration costs, and in fees. Having a will will ensure that your estate gets, gets distributed to the people and or entities, institutions that you desire. And most important, everybody's situation is different. So it's in your best interest to get legal and financial advice as you consider creating an estate plan. I think this brings us to the end of our prepared remarks. Remarks. Thank you all for your indulgence and we are available for your questions. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maxine. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much, Anthony. I see a lot of very thoughtful expressions online. I think persons are thinking deeply, like Andrea Chin Scott. It's good to see you, Andrea, after so many years. You still have your pretty face there. You don't look the least bit stressed like me. And Anthony. 
Uh, but it's good to see everyone online. I think we have over 74 persons online. So if you have a question, um, and go ahead, identify yourself, please. There are a few already. They're all going to call them up. Oh, okay. Audley? Yes. Well, Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Excellent presentation so far. Um, the first question is, in your will, are there persons disqualified from being witnesses? Example, if children are being witnesses, where spouses are the beneficiary. I'm not so sure who that one um, is. Yes, I will take it on. Um, the, the law of Jamaica in particular, and by, by extension, the, the Commonwealth, always presumed that when a beneficiary witnesses a will, um, there is an intention on that beneficiary to, to sway or to persuade the testator, that is the person making the will, to give them something. So the current practice is that the beneficiary should not be a witness to the will. Get someone else to, to, um, to, to witness the will because there is a presumption in law that that beneficiary either threatened or persuaded or, 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 or coerced or could have duress the testator in, in giving them something. I must also say that there has been a recent amendment to the laws of Jamaica where if someone has um, witnessed the will and they are a beneficiary, that they could possibly get through. But then that involves a legal process and the legal process um, is a bit tedious. Uh, they can get through, they may get through, but oftentimes it's challenging. So to avoid it, no beneficiary should sign the, the will. And can I just add, yes? Uh, yes. can I just add, no beneficiary or the, um, the executor, because the executor stands to benefit by getting a commission. Yes. So there's a presumption that beneficiary or executor should not bear with, uh, should not bear witness on, on, on view influence on the That's on correct. the test data. That's correct. Okay. okay. Another one. Um, I'm guessing this is for Maxine or or Anthony. What happens if the executor does not take any steps to probate the will, or if they decide to act years after someone dies? Is it the estate value that the date of death or the date that the executor commences probate proceeding? All right. So two things. The 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 estate, in terms of value, is always at the date of death. So if the person died in, say, 2000, and the administration of the estate commences in 2020, that is what, 20 years? Then the value of the estate would be as at 2000 and not 2020. Now, the other question is, what happens if the executor either refuses to administer the estate or he fails or just um, don't want to do anything. And this is very simple. You can go to court. You can ask the court for an order to remove that executor on the grounds that they are either unwilling or being very uncooperative. But the easiest way and the most um, cost-effective way is to ask that executor to sign a document called renunciation. It's a very simple document prepared by an attorney and all it is saying is that the executor agrees that they will give up their responsibility. It's, it's, it's easier, it's cost effective and uh, someone else can come the place. Maxine, are there any differences with the US market? No, that's, that's basically the same thing. Basically the same thing. All right, okay, another question. Audrey, um, I just wanted to tell everyone that we're streaming live on Facebook. I'm not sure if everyone is aware of that. Uh, so we're really uh, going out massively. And I think we have 76 logins on the call, which I think is an improvement, a significant increase over the last, last session. Next question. Next question. And this, is, and this is a good one for the audience and for the person that we have as panelists today. If I have an estate across two or three countries, 
how do I deal with this in a will slash estate plan? And what will my executor and beneficiary face? And how can I make this tax efficient? And if I can throw out a continuation of that, do you need two separate wills for two separate jurisdictions? Um, I, guess, I, I, guess, I, guess, I guess I could jump in on, on that. I had to cover one, one estate which did, dealt with Canada, US, and Jamaica. One, is, one will. Um, this is why um, the will is so important because I had to get copies of the will, both the US and copies to Jamaica um, to satisfy the, 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 um, the, the will. So that goes a long, a long way. And it's to transfer the funds when, it, when we get to satisfy the beneficiary. Again, the will has to go with the transferring of the funds. Can I jump in? Please do. OK, so the, 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 the high level answer is one, one will is sufficient. The jurisdiction in which you submit the will for probate, will issue letters, letters testamentary naming the executor. So let's say the, 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 the decedent resided in, in, in the US, in New York. So the surrogate court in New York issues letters testamentary. Those same letters can be used in Jamaica. I, I know there's a term for it, which Anthony can remind me. Um, it's called resealing. Resealing. So the, the, the appointment of the executor in New York is still recognized in the other jurisdictions. In other words, you don't have to refile for probate, but you have to present the will and the appointment of the fiduciary, appointment of the executor. Yep. So to the other jurisdictions where property is. Okay. Excellent. Um, excellent. Anthony, any follow up with that? Because I think that's a very, very excellent question based on our audience. Yes. Um, so, so as Maxine said and, and, and Paul, what is required is one will is sufficient and we want to emphasize to our, our, our viewers that it is always important that you name um, at least two uh, executors. You can name one, there's no rule that says you must name two or three, but it's always good to name um, two for many uh, obvious reasons. Now, all that is required is one will. You don't need two, you don't need three. And once the will is probated in one jurisdiction, for example, the, the person who made the will, we call him the testator. If that person died in London and they have properties in London, they can, they can administer the estate in London. They can go to the courts in London and the court would um, grant probate in London. Then if they have properties in Jamaica, then that probate document will be sent to the lawyers in Jamaica. And then the lawyers in Jamaica will then do what is called a, a re-sealing. It's really a re-approval of the document in London. It's a, a less tedious exercise. And once that is done, then it gives the executor the power, the authority, and full control of their estate in Jamaica. I really do appreciate that question because um, a lot of us on the call may have family or you may own property between Canada or the US or you have, you're in charge of or taking care of your parents' home, elderly parents' home back in Jamaica or, or London and so on. So I really appreciate that call as a really good one. Another one, what are the benefits of using a trust instead of a will in Canada? Um, uh, the trust is... It, it's okay, but the will spells out more. And if you want, if you want to do several uh, beneficiaries, the will can spell it out more. The, the trust, it's it's usually it's it's specific, and it, um, in the in the in the trust, the assets can change, you know, from from time to time. So. Uh, I, I would say some of this stuff can go in trust, and 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 but the will should the will should be the one to use uh, for general purposes. Okay, I hope well, that answered that question. Let me, now let me just um, say something about the trust as well. Um, you can have the trust 
and the will working together, certainly in Jamaica. Now, you don't have to die for you to create a trust. You can have a living trust. I'm going to give an example. I represented a, an outstanding pastor, a very outstanding evangelist. And he said to me, Anthony, I love my wife very, very much. I will not sacrifice her for anything. But guess what? I have a problem with her. And my problem with her is that she's a spendthrift. She could just not control the expenses, I mean, the, the income. And so what we did was to create a trust instrument. He was alive, she was alive. And the, what the trust did was to name a trustee and that trustee would be given power and authority how to invest the money. He had several properties and the income of those properties in the trust document, we told the, exec, the trustee how the wife was to benefit and, and, and how the children were to benefit as well. And upon death as well, you can have the will saying certain things and you can have your trust document that says certain things in terms of how your property income are to be distributed. And so the trust um, in Jamaica can go a very far away. It can be very extensive and monitor from your first child to your last child. Maxine, any thoughts on that or any differences in the U.S. market? No, it's very similar. The, the, the sort of benefit or advantage of, of, of a trust is that it can, I mean, if, if, if it's done properly and if it, if it contemplates all the assets and all the people you want to benefit, um, it avoids probate. So, um, you know, uh, as I said in the presentation, a trust is basically a contract document and it spells out, you know, who controls the assets, um, when the beneficiaries can get it, uh, the, the example that Anthony used about controlling how, how much the wife got for spending, very often a trust is used for that. Um, very often it's used to control how children, you know, easy come, easy go. Daddy dies, you get daddy's money on lump sum and it's gone in a flash. Whereas in the trust document, you can, you can stipulate that the child gets $10,000 a year. Yeah. rather than getting the lump sum. So there are benefits, um, def definite benefits to having the trust. Uh, I, I personally recommend having both yes. because very often you create a trust and you, well, not you, but the, the, the trustee forgets to put all the assets under the trust. And or you acquire additional assets and those assets don't get put under the trust. Yeah. So it, it's kind of a catch all to have both. It's, it's what I call belt and suspenders. You, you have the trust, but just in case there's an asset that didn't make it into the trust, it's covered under the way. Correct. Well, the or, they, or they were running really a lot of the time. It's, it's just about 8.30 US time and it's 7.30 in Jamaica, um, but I want to just extend it a little bit with, with Denzel's permission. I know there are others on the line who may want to interact directly into the session. So before we take any more questions, I'd, I'd love to open the floor. And I also want to say that the association, the Alumni Association, will make this presentation available. Uh, right, Jermaine? Um, I think so uh, for the non ardenites who may not be on the mailing list, please feel free to put your email address and your name in the chat box so that we can, we can send you uh, the information. So anybody on the line wants to ask a question and participate directly in the meeting? If not, I'm going to start calling names. OK, we'll talk at once. Andrew Chin Scott. <laughs> All right. Well, I can. I, let me just ask Andrew. one last Andrew question before. before. Okay. Before. So, no, Andrew. Oh, Andrew is back. Oh, I know Andrew as well. Hi, Andrew. Hey, Audley. Um, 
There's a one question before we go to Andrea. Um, this one was, what generally happens if a will is not done and children are left behind with identified assets and children are below 18? And then Andrea, you, we're going to you after um, the panelists have answered that one. All right, um, Sir Audley, the law is very clear. The law says in Jamaica, and this is so in the Commonwealth Caribbean and the Commonwealth countries, that if you do not make a will, then the government of that particular jurisdiction will essentially make it for you. So under the law, what happens is that if you don't make the will, then they, 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 if the parties are married, um, then upon death, 50% will go to the spouse and the remaining 50% will go to the children divided equally. In other words, if there are four children, it will be 50% divided by four. And if there are six children, 50% divided by six. Now, um, and if there are identifiable assets, then all those assets will come into the pool. What we find is that in, at this juncture, then squabbles will, will take place because I have seen where siblings now start to rank their, their beneficial interests. And so some are saying, well, you know, I'm the first one, so I'm to get the most, I'm, I'm the second one, I'm to get the most, I'm the one who daddy love the most. All of these um, simple nuances in the practice um, arises. So essentially, if you want to ensure that your beneficiaries are taken care of, then you make your will and name your beneficiaries. But if no will is made, then the act that, that governs it is called the Interstate and, and Property Charges Act. Max, seen any differences in, in yeah. the U.S.? Um, not really. I mean, the, 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 okay. So in the U.S., we're dealing with fifty different states, and the 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 statutes that govern vary from state to state, but the principle is the same. The principle is the same. Um, it would be your, your estate would be governed by the, the laws of dissent and distribution, um, the administration laws, an administrator will be appointed. Um, similar, if, if, if you have a wife, 50% to the, well, a spouse, wife or husband, 50% to the spouse, 50% um, distributed among the children. If no spouse, um, then pretty much all to the children. Thank you. So I'm following uh, Mark's guidance, Andrea Trent Scott and I'm seeing <laughs> Anne-Marie Jones hand was up and also Olive James. So Andrea. All right. I, I, I just thank you all for this forum. It was rather informative. Um, Maxine, you answered quite a lot of the questions that I would have asked. Um, and being that I have property back in Jamaica and here, you know, it, it really ties up what I need to do to put my house in order. But one other thing I, I heard you talk about was the executive fees and I'm not sure, I was clear on it. A friend of mine recently asked me to be an executor and then you mentioned about fees and having me pay fees out of my pocket. That just didn't stand good with me. So I wanted to find out how is, are those fees accounted for? Is it a part of the estate of the person? How are they dealt with? Okay, Andrew, I, I think um, you may have misunderstood a little bit what I said. The executor gets a fee. The executor is entitled to a fee. And that is, um, that is set by statute. It ranges from you know, five to 7%, depending on the state you're in. All right. Um, you should not be paying anything out of pocket to administer to, to um, administer the estate on behalf of the decedent. Uh, but 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 if 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 the person pays out of their pocket, then it is what we call a recoverable expense. Oh yeah, it's a recoverable right, expense. Right, recover, you you would be reimbursed. Recoverable expense. That was my question. I just realized I was on mute. Yes, it is a recoverable expense, um, Andrea. So mm -hmm. you can recover it from the estate. Okay. Um, so question from Anne-Marie Jones and Olive James. I know Olive had asked to raise their hand earlier as well. So. Yes. Okay. Are you hearing me? Yes. 
Okay, I mean, my name is Olive Chung James. I am the vin I'm vintage from Paul Barnett time. And this is a I situation <laughs> I see all the time. I'm calling you from, from Miami, Florida. I, I'm, I am, I've, I've been a physician here for many, many years. And there's a problem that I see. I see a lot of older patients. And a lot of them have assets. They have their power of attorney, a child or whatever. They, they, they're in need of help. They are now, um, they have Alzheimer's. And I find a lot of times the children will not use the, their parents' money to take care of them. Um, so I want to know if, if there's something that can be set up where as we get older, we can sort of direct what is going to happen to us when we are in, incapacitated, not dead, but incapacitated. Yeah. I gather that there's a, a living trust or something like that. Yeah. But I think we need some explanation as to how that works. And, and um, that's sort of thing. Okay. Um, Olive, in relation to the living trust, I'm going to give you one example. Um, I could have an insurance policy, and under that policy, I have um, life insurance of about 25 million or 30 million. I could name someone as my executor, um, trustee rather, and I have four children, and I could name a trustee, and that trustee is Olive James, and I would say to Olive James, what she's to do in relation to my four children. And I can give full details. Um, at what stage um, are they to enter university? At what stage are they to get the full sum? Um, how, are they, how are their university fees to be paid? Uh, what rental property, sorry, income goes to them? So the trust document really sets out essentially what is it that you want to accomplish. And all that is required is for the the, 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 the testator, right, or the trustor to just tell the attorney what exactly he wants to accomplish. And the attorney will write that down, put it in legal language, and then create the trust so that the, the trustee will have full powers and authority to, to carry out your wishes. Maxine, any differences? No, that's basically the same. But I think the, the other thing that I would want to address, just based on the scenario that, that Olive has um, laid out. So if you, you mentioned the fact that you have patients with Alzheimer's. If, if they have not yet done a trust, it's probably a little bit too late um, for, for what Anthony just talked about. Because you have to, you have to be of sound mind to, to create a trust. Um, hopefully, um, they would have created a, a power of attorney. And this goes back to like the early part of the presentation when I, said, when I talked about all the things that should go into your estate planning. Because if you have what's called a durable power of attorney, then that person who you appointed has the authority whilst you're alive to make decisions with regard to how your assets are spent. And hopefully, that person would have your interests at heart to spend those assets to take care of you. OK. And thank you very, very much for that. And I guess in the interest of time, I just want to pass it back over to Mark. Mark, I'm not sure if you had a discussion with Denzel as well, but over to you. Did Anne Marie Jones have a question? You had mentioned Anne Marie Audley. Yes, I did. Uh, um, Ask her question. Okay, for a person who is making a will, can that can they name their executor as beneficiary also? Okay. Yes. The executive can also be a beneficiary. 
But not a witness. But not a witness. Okay. Right. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, so we're now at 841. I just think this has just been a phenomenal meeting. The information has just been solid. Uh, the presenters have been on the top of their game. Anthony, I heard you were good, but I didn't know you were this good. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark, just before you close, yes, could I just put uh, plug something in? Um, several persons have purchased properties and uh, may intend to purchase property or properties uh, sometime in the near future. And it doesn't matter whether you're in Jamaica, North America, whichever country. One of the things I'm going to recommend is that whenever you're purchasing property, try to ensure that you have a life insurance coverage in relation to the principal amount of money that you borrow. Why is it important? It is important because in the event of death, the mortgage, be it 10 million, 15 million, 12 million, or even $1 million, will automatically be paid off. I just settled an estate with two young men, two young men in the United States. Their mother um, bought property, had a mortgage of $15 million. She died suddenly of um, cancer. And uh, when they came to my office, flew down from the United States, they were in tears, absolute tears. And the question they asked is, you know, where would they get the $15 million from? Little did they know that the mother had life insurance of $15 million. The property was paid off automatically. So this is one way we can ensure that we take care of our estate. And finally, critical illness. I do not own any shares in any um, insurance companies and neither am I an advertising agent. But a lot of persons suffer critical illnesses and we have to also take care of our estate by ensuring that we have some basic critical illness policies. And I would suggest the minimum is $3 million because to do radiation treatment, uh, if we get a stroke, if we get um, the loss of a limb, we don't need to drive carefully on the road. All we need to um, encounter is an, an imbecile, uh, a drunken man that just run into your car and then you lose a limb, your eyesight, and so a critical illness will come right into the picture. And what do you do with your loved ones? They depend on you. So life insurance and critical illnesses are very important, especially in relation to those persons who are purchasing property. It helps and minimize our taxes and expenses and our children and our spouse. Okay, thank you, Council. Well said. Now, I know we have to close, but I know Sydney Mattis has had her hand up um, oddly. So, Sydney, this is Sydney, this is a lady, right? S I D N E. Do you want to ask your question now, Sydney Mattis? Sheila? I apologize, that was on error. Please ignore. <laughs> You don't have anything to add or contribute? Well, just thank you so much for this information. Um, it's really timely as I was looking into um, estate planning myself. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Sydney. And I hope everyone found this session invaluable. Um, as you consider now, as you move forward with your lives, so you're going to plan your estate no matter what you have. I must tell you, I must confess, whenever I think about doing a will, I think, oh my God, am I going to die? Is this an omen? Um, I have a wife who constantly reminds me to be sensible about that. But I know that's some cultural issue from Jamaica that needs, that's twisted and I just need to get on to it. So I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. I want to close off by asking uh, Denzel just to say a few words. Um, as well as the president of the association. Um, so uh, let's start with Jermaine. Jermaine, any closing comments? Okay, Jermaine is off. Denzel, why don't you jump on? Yes, uh, uh, really, this has been a labor of love. And, um, you know, I just want to thank uh, Anthony, Maxine, and Paul. Uh, really, really
really good job. We've been, you know, talking about this for a while, and uh, we finally got it done. Now I notice our, our numbers, uh, you know, jump from seventy-eight to eighty-one. So that that's great numbers. Of quite an improvement over our last webinar. And that Facebook, we don't know. Um, so you know, the comments here I, I'm seeing very good. Uh, invaluable information very good presentation um you know some great comments a very good overview of the different perspective thanks to the presenter uh, you know some really good comments so i'm i'm glad at least it's working for you guys now for the people who um who are visitors not affiliated with the Ireland of my association i've collected nine email addresses here so when that video becomes available and the link is available um, I will get that link out to you so that you can at least have access to take a peek, share it with your family, and um, and 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 do something good to solve any any unknown problems at this point in time. So thank you all for coming out. Um, it seems that based on the conversation we have, it seems you know everybody was really and 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 none of you moved 78, 78 to eighty one person. So it, it means that you were riveted here. And you wanted to hear a little bit more about the subject. So um, before I go, I'm just going to turn it over to um, our president who, was, who, who, who didn't make a comment just now to make his final comment. Jermaine? Okay, thank you very much, Vincent. Thank you very much, Mark. I think Mark did an excellent job in terms of bringing his expertise at um, properly facilitating this webinar. I think it was very good. So I want to thank all of the persons um, that were, were the ones that caused this webinar to be what it is. I think this was an excellent webinar and uh, um, it is one that I am stimulated to actually uh, look at again. <laughs> so um, thanks everyone. Um, thanks to all of the persons who joined by Facebook. Um, we had quite a number of persons, a few persons rather, who were um, tuning in through Facebook. And so that helped to broaden the number of persons who were able to see this webinar live. And so thanks everyone for making this. Um, I really enjoyed it. Over to you, Mark. Okay, thank you, Jermaine. And I hope you have been inspired enough that if you haven't yet made your will, go and make the will. Tonight, okay, yes. <laughs> get it done. Get it done. So uh, I just think it would be appropriate for everyone and I just to give a round of applause to our presenters, Anthony Atticus Williams, uh, Maxine White, and Paul Barnett. Please, a round of applause, you can open your mics. And I thank our presenters uh, for this uh, presentation. And for all of, all of you in Jamaica, um, I don't need to tell you, if you really need great expert advice, Call Atticus, but he was at Arden. He knew he wanted to be a man. So, uh, and he will give special discounted rates to Ardenites. Really? <laughs> Maxine says she's retired, but I don't know any lawyer who's ever really retired. So, if you're in the American jurisdiction, please reach out uh, to Maxine. And of course, everybody knows how to reach Paul um, in Canada. So this has been a, a wonderful session. So until the next Arden Alumni International Webinar, have a great night. And for those of you going to the Arden graduation tomorrow, it's a virtual graduation. Um, say hi from all of us here in the diaspora. And until we see you, don't forget Atlanta. Have a great Optima weekend and a great Optima week. Thank you. Signing out. Pleasure. Bye.